The author reads from his notebook, Wheeler on the Passaic, take one. For the second voyage of the Sevis Nautis, our goal was a straight shot down the hack from Snake Hill into Newark Bay, and then up the mouth of the Passaic. Frank V and I picked a Thursday when both of us were free and met at my house for the mission. On our previous test run, we had noticed several key elements missing from the boat, mainly cup holders, storage baskets, and a beamy top to separate us from the beating summer sun. The canopy, unfortunately, couldn't be procured in time for our second outing, but I slathered myself in sunscreen and wore an old pillowcase on my head like a bandana, which added to the overall pirate effect of the boat. This was to be my first time piloting a vessel through Newark Bay. I had been this route on other people's boats and have studied the charts for this area, but I still wouldn't have felt confident without Frank in the seat next to me. I first met Frank V at the Callaloo Cafe during my release party for my Weird New Jersey special issue, Nightshade on the Passaic. I had taken a picture of three antique lighting fixtures that someone had hung in Troy Meadows Swamp near Route 280. It definitely qualified as a weird find, so the picture made it into the magazine. Frank came up to me at the party and asked me to sign the photo of the lights. I usually write on the centerfold of the magazine for people, so I asked him why this particular picture. He replied, I hung those lights in the swamp. I asked him, okay, if that's true, what's directly behind the lights? Only the person who put the lights in this particular spot would know what was behind the undergrowth. He answered without hesitation, it's a digger arm and a claw for an excavator. Sure enough, he was right. I signed the picture for him and went on with the party without thinking much about it. Years later, I was at a funeral and I ran into Frank again. He recognized me and came up and introduced himself. After reminding me about the picture of the lights, I remembered him from the party. In hushed tones, because we were both mourners, he asked me what I had been up to lately. I told him about my goals on the river, to write a book and film a movie, and expressed my intention to own a speedboat for patrolling the Lower Passaic on a regular basis. He listened intently and then began telling me stories about his adventures on the Lower Passaic in his boat, the Jersey Tomato. If we hadn't been at a wake, we probably would have compared notes for hours, but the services began and we went in to pay our respects. Less than a week later, I tracked down Frank online, and we began an ongoing correspondence discussing Craigslist ads for boats in the North Jersey area. I soon found out that Frank V is not only an avid Passaic River boater, but also an expert mechanic who is something of a wizard on anything that consumes gasoline. We must have looked at 20 boats together before I bought what was to become the Sevis Natus. I never could have known it at the nightshade party, but Frank and I struck up a friendship based on the river, and I came to rely on him as my guide for navigation, boating technique, and all things mechanical. In that context, it's easy to see why I wanted Frank along for the Sevis Nautis' first run through Newark Bay. I know from past boating experience that when the wind picks up in the bay, whitecaps aren't far behind. After the final walkthrough at my house to make sure everything was strapped and secure, we hopped into my truck and pulled the boat behind us up Route 3 to the boat ramp at Snake Hill in Secaucus. We pulled up to the Hackensack at low tide with no wind and glass water. Perfect boating conditions. Blue skies and gorgeous 90-degree weather beckoned us. Working together, the boat was soon off the trailer and floating happily in the hack. Frank lashed her to the dock while I pulled the truck into a parking space. I took a leak in the bushes before leaving dry land, walked down the dock, and hopped into the boat. I released the latch on the outboard and set it down into the water, pumped up the ball on the fuel line and turned the key. The motor immediately started purring, eager to put in a day's work. In addition to being the boat's first run up the Passaic, it was also a testing day for a new tripod mounting system that I had been experimenting with on dry land. It's very hard to get steady video on a fast-moving boat in choppy water, but I was committed to finding a way to stabilize my movies without spending a ton of money. Once everything was stowed and the camera was secure, Frank untied the boat and I coasted out into the main channel. Bright brown water shimmered under us as if we were on a lake instead of a river. The motor was warm and all systems were go, so I jammed the throttle forward. The Sevis Nautis jumped up on plane and we were cruising. Our first landmark downstream was the defunct rail bridge at Snake Hill. As we motored past, I thought about the many times I'd walked the Kearney Marsh on those very train tracks and ended up staring at the Hackensack, wishing I had a boat in the water. If the camera had been pointed at me, it would have recorded a huge smile written across my face, but instead it did its job in the bow, collecting data as we passed under the turnpike towards Nork Bay. We had been down here the previous week on the boat's first test run, so we didn't linger at the incredible industrial sites along the lower hack. The Passaic River was calling us. 
We did, however, pause at the Kearney Generating Station for a minute under the Pulaski Skyway because no matter how many times I see it, I'm always in awe of the sheer size and beauty of these aging relics. I gunned it into the bay and the water turned from glass to choppy in an instant, but it was nothing that the Sevis Nautis couldn't handle. She is a 17-foot glass tron with a big old Johnson on the back, and we found out that she glides over small bay swells like she's flying. We rounded the navigation pylons around Kearney Point and zoomed north as cormorants and seagulls fluttered around us. We had followed the green buoys on the starboard rail all the way down the hack and into the bay. Once we made the turn around the last navigation cairn and headed inland up the Passaic, the buoys switched sides. Because we were now headed inland, we were required to keep the red buoys on our starboard, keeping to the rule, red right return. Although I had Frank as a guide, I was also glad that I had spent so much time studying boating books and learning the basic laws of navigation. People tend to scoff at boating schools and licensing, but once you get out there with the cargo ships and ocean liners, it pays to know the rules of the road. My heart leapt as we entered the mouth of the river. It was literally a dream come true for me to own my own boat and be exploring the lower Passaic. I didn't take a single moment of the experience for granted as we passed the double brick stack on Kearney Point passed under one and nine, and then the Pulaski Skyway. There were so many things to see and film. A freight engine lumbered across the Point No Point Rail Bridge. The abandoned Essex generating station loomed off to port. Fish jumped, seabirds squawked. The boat was running perfect and I was happy. The shade under the turnpike felt glorious after being in the roaring sun. Passing under these bridges, one can really see how the Passaic and Hackensack are sister rivers. The roadways and rail lines that bridge one river often spurs both waterways on their way to and from New York City. Upriver from the turnpike, we pass the abandoned white building, the rotting pier, sunken boat, and gravestone dumping ground that was the setting for my latest story in Weird, New Jersey. From our vantage point, I could just make out the Nina Lescott stone sticking out of the shoreline amongst the ragweeds. Upriver, a giant crane and a collection of barges mark the Diamond Shamrock Superfund site. We made several passes back and forth to photograph and film this historic cleanup. When we had our fill, I hit the throttle again and we were speeding through downtown Newark to our eventual destination, Rapp's Boatyard. It didn't take us long to get there, but I was a little disappointed because Bill Rapp wasn't in. We tied up to his docks anyway and had lunch on the porch. I felt grateful that I'm friends with Bill and am able to stop in for a break without having to ask permission. There aren't many places along the river that are friendly to power boaters, and Raps is the last working boatyard clinging to the shores of the Passaic. After the destruction brought on by Hurricane Irene, he's barely holding on, but there are still boaters who pay to keep their vessels here. As we cooled off on the porch amongst the cries of shorebirds and the smell of salt water, it made me sad to think that Raps is the last crumbling piece of history to represent the bygone age of pleasure boating on the Passaic. But in another way, it made me glad that I got to see it, even if I was coming along at the tail end. Besides, what do I care about would-be boaters? I've always been attracted to hard-to-reach places. The fact that there are no reliable access points along the lower Passaic keeps the water clear for those of us willing to put in the work. After lunch, we hopped back in the boat, and Frank took the helm so I could play with the camera. I never get tired of taking pictures of downtown Newark from the water. The aging lift bridges and towering buildings are marvels of engineering that are a testament to the humans before us who planned the foundation of our civilization. The Newark waterfront still has a long way to go, but one day it will probably resemble Hoboken with its beautiful riverfront walkways and multi-million dollar apartments. As someone who revels in abandonment and decay, I was again happy that I get to see it rusty and crumbling, yet still remarkably serviceable. The revitalization of Newark may have already begun, but there is still plenty of creepy abandoned industry to serve as my playground. We took our time heading downstream, and along the way I received a text message from Mark Baran at Weird, New Jersey, telling me about a body found face down in the Passaic. His text had a link to the news story, and Frank and I were all set to turn the boat around, but as I read further, I realized that the corpse was discovered above the Dundee Dam, which is out of our navigation range. The Sevis Natus is useful for navigating about 15 miles of the lower Passaic from Newark Bay to Wallington, New Jersey. Above Wallington, the river is too shallow to reach the Dundee Dam, but the tidal influence of the Atlantic is felt all the way to the base of the falls. Newark Bay was picking up as we headed home towards my truck. Whitecaps were brimming off the Kearney Shoal, but we stuck to the deep water and the Sevis Natus made short work of the moderate chop. Soon we were up the hack, and almost before I was ready to call it a day, we were back at Snake Hill. 
As we passed the hill, a huge barge, the Lisa, was coming downstream at an extremely low speed, being pushed by a tugboat. Sirens started going off behind us, and we realized that workers were preparing to swing the active rail bridge on its tremendous rotating gear in order to let the barge through. This type of heavy work is fascinating to witness, so we turned around and sped down the hack to wait for the barge to come our way. At this point, my desperate need for a seaworthy cameraman became painfully obvious. The memory card in my camera filled up and stopped recording just as the barge was about to pass through the bridge. Trying to film a movie with a little Sony pocket camera, run a speedboat with no money, and write a book with no publisher is the challenge that I'm up against out here on North Jersey's mightiest rivers. If it wasn't for the support of family and a few close friends, I never could have made it this far. It isn't easy trying to live out dreams in the real world, but a wise man once told me that you cannot testify without first going through a test. As I learn to follow the currents of the Passaic, a hidden world unfolds before me. Each voyage uncovers new material to film and write about. I am grateful for every moment I get to spend out there, and the Passaic rewards me for my efforts as I strive to make my bones on the river. <laughs>